Okay, we're live. We're live. Exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to make sure it's working on the YouTube. Yes, it is. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is exciting. So I don't know, should we like wait a minute for people to come if they're coming or get started? I guess we'll, we'll introduce you. That's what we'll do. Oh, so right. hello, everybody. Um, this, let's see. No, there. This is Melanie. <laughs> Melanie Frenchie is her channel. She is wonderful. She's been reading this whole um, book with me for like eight weeks. Um, we are here to discuss, yes, she has it right there. Um, we're here to discuss The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the original book by Victor Hugo, and uh, go. we will review it, and then we will do like a deep dive discussion with lots of spoilers. So whether you want spoilers or not, this is a good video for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, we hope that you will discuss with us in the comments. If there's a good comment that comes up, um, I might even highlight it on the screen so everybody can see your comment. Only if you're comfortable with it, though. <laughs> um, so let's see. Anything else? Oh, and I didn't really. So Melanie's channel. Uh, Melanie uh, does a lot of really fun stuff over her channel. I do highly recommend it. She does. Um, she did like the owls and she also reads like tons of classics and she like last I think it was last month you said you read like 11 books was that right yeah I think so and you're I mean, like it's not that I'm much <laughs> <laughs> you're nuts that's a lot <laughs> oh well this month I read a lot of classic and it took me quite a long time but I really yeah. enjoyed that and, and um, I'm French so if oh, I yes. say stuff weird, weirdly, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Names and stuff, that's why. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Um, I definitely recommend, uh, it, it, after you listen to her talk for a little while, you're definitely going to want to go check out her channel and subscribe. I promise. She's so insightful and wonderful. So, um, if you really, and like I said, we, we've been discussing this for, about eight weeks together. We've been breaking it down part by part. And if you are interested in that kind of analysis and discussion of big, fat, thick books, <laughs> um, I do recommend checking out uh, the book club, which I will link down below. It's a Facebook book club. And uh, we just nerd out about whatever book we're doing. And next we're doing uh, The Stormlight Archives by Brandon Sanderson. So it's going to be great. I uh, don't want to miss it if you're interested in reading those. I really hope you will join us. And uh, I guess let's get started on our... So I, I thought maybe we could start off with like a non-spoilery synopsis, Melanie. Do you have okay. any thoughts on what the book is about as a whole? Um, so uh, Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. Uh, it a book that was written around the 19th, the mid 19th century, if I remember right. It is one of Hugo's first book. He wrote it when he was 26 and he already had a contract for two years to write a book and had no inspiration and he didn't know what to talk about and he locked himself in his house and wrote this in one year was very passionate about uh, architecture and the Gothic churches and cathedral all over France that were uh, starting to crumble because of the different revolution happening and nobody taking care of them. So he imagined this story where the main character, I would say, is Notre Dame, the main cathedral in Paris. I think all of you knows about it when like, it burned last year. <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we have still, Notre Dame is still here today because of this. Because people in France read this and fell in love with the architecture, fell back in love with the architecture and started to preserve it and take care of it. Um, so 
we have Notre Dame in this story, but we also have um, Archidiac, Claude Frollo. He is the main priest of the cathedral. I don't know. I, I've read it in French. I don't have the vocabulary in English. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the Archdeacon. Yeah. We follow him, uh, Quasimodo, Quasimodo, who is a hunchback. He is classified as a monster. He has been raised in Notre Dame and never really went out. And the third guy we have is Phoebus um, de something. Um, he yeah. is <laughs> he's part of the gendarme of Paris, taking like the policing of the city. He's very handsome, very young, and he throws to a woman, but wouldn't mind looking elsewhere and <laughs> yeah. so seeing his, his buddies drinking at the pubs. Um, and the, the last main character we have in this story is Esmeralda, a young gypsy woman who dances away for money in the streets of Paris. Um, and she's very beautiful. She has this little goat that follows her around and with who she plays with um, called Jali. And if if you haven't fallen in love by, with Jali by the end of this book, then I don't know. <laughs> no one says this about you, but <laughs> something is wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, well, this is like the kind of the context. Would you like to talk more about the plot? <laughs> that was great. That was very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> and I just wanted to say to you, hello, Noah, and hello, Danny. It's great Hi, to have you guys you. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, basically, I, I felt like the plot was essentially four guys competing for the attention of the beautiful young gypsy Esmeralda. And, and Melanie mentioned some of the guys. And uh, yeah, um, it, it, it really um, shows some different kinds of love. So there's a very noble love and then there's lots of unhealthy kinds of love going on. So it's very much a historical drama in that sense. And uh, a tragedy, yeah, I would say. Yes, a tragedy. I didn't know, necessarily know going in that it was going to be quite such a tragedy but mm. um yeah definitely <laughs> um let's see yeah and melanie described the purpose of the book very well so um let's see be I'm prepared of... for some essays on architecture in this book as well yes oh, yes man. i was gonna yeah so as far as like the strengths and weaknesses of this book I feel like those essays, there's there's a bunch of essays in the book where Hugo gets really into the architecture of the period, like medieval architecture in general, um, and then specifically Paris, and even more specifically the cathedral. And uh, those are not the easiest thing to read, but they are important to his theme and his purpose. So I was just listening to a review of this book um, from books like Woe, which I don't know why I wasn't subscribed to her before. She's hilarious. <laughs> but, um, and she was saying, like, that would be a great, like, um, primary source used for a class, you know, that she could use for a class. So, um, for that period. And, uh, that was an interesting thought, too. I, I, I did, and she really, she struggled to read those periods, but she thought they were really integral and interesting as well. And that's, that's kind of where I am with it. Like it probably wouldn't make it into a book today, but I'm glad it was there. <laughs> it's a strength and a weakness. Yeah. I feel like. And um, if, if you struggle going through it, you can just keep it. Like it wouldn't very, it, it wouldn't change the plot that, that much. And then you can come back right. to it. Or, right. I think it was originally published without some of those essays and later, you know, after it was so popular, they decided, oh, we can put these, exactly. you know, previously unseen chapters back yeah. into it. So you can definitely read it without those. But and in fact, my audiobook version t left out some of that stuff. Like 
I was listening to an audiobook as I was reading along with it some of the time, um, just when I was struggling to get into it. And a lot of times those chapters weren't even in the audiobook. So, <laughs> so any other strengths and weaknesses that you want to talk about, Melanie? Um, I'm, I'm trying to word my thoughts. Um, for me, one of the strengths is the exploration of emotions and feelings. Um, just the emotion, the feeling of love is um, we have maybe five perspectives on it. We have the, well, I forgot one character, which is called Pierre Gringoire, and he is um, an artist, <laughs> he is a tragedist, <laughs> and he is in a bad uh, way in his life where he needs a lot of money and he ends up on the street and by some, he is uh, he comes in contact with Esmeralda as well, and he is also kind of in love with her. Or like, uh, th he, there is an emotion of love connected to him and Esmeralda as well. So you see all those emotion and the way Esmeralda loved the other characters back or not. And I love the um, that we see that just in basic emotion disconstructed in the, all those different type of emotions uh, feelings <laughs> i hope i'm mm -hmm. articulating my thoughts uh, in a way you can understand it i know it's not well but if you can understand it good. <laughs> you always do great <laughs> <laughs> so that that's one of the strengths for me i love seeing how some character got consumed, how some character got out of it. Uh, there were some very pure love, some very detrimental loves. Uh, and other than the feelings you have also, um, Hugo in this book is very anticlerical. So there is a big discussion around the church and priests and the Catholic church. Um, yeah, Catholic Church, church in France. Um, so that's very interesting to have this point of view around this era. Mm -hmm. And there is also a discussion around justice, the justice system and the justice by the people in the street. And uh, that I, I found fascinating as well in this book. Okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. I definitely think all those themes that you mentioned are big strong points for me as well he just he really dives deep into his themes and develops them really well um so what he ends up doing is he picks um like representatives from different like levels of society that are supposed to be authority figures and um essentially they all do horribly at their job and um that kind of fits into another theme in the book of monstrousness because um, essentially, the one character who actually looks monstrous has the most noble heart. And all the people who, you know, like Phoebus is like, his name means the sun god, and he's very handsome. And he's just, he's like a womanizer and, a, and, and not a good guy at all. Uh, totally abuses his position and his power. And then the Spoilers. priest. <laughs> what? Spoilers. <laughs> Oh, yes. Sorry. Spoilers. Mm, yeah, maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> well, so now, now we are talking into spoilers. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, essentially, there's just a lot of abuse of power there. And um, let's see. Anything else that I can say without spoilers? <laughs> um, if, you, if you know Paris, if you have been to Paris, if, and if you miss it, this is a great book as well. Like I have been to Paris lo loads of, of time and not being able to go right now, uh, reading this and there's still a lot of, of places that are, are still there, not in the same way, not with the same um, purpose, but they're still there and knowing that, researching online what it was supposed to look like, what was the purpose of, purpose of those places 
uh, and comparing it to nowadays, it's very interesting. So if you like Paris, if you want to go, that is a great way. Um, yeah, that is a great way to visit it or revisit it. <laughs> It was so fun reading this with you because you had you you just had like a really a better understanding I think of sometimes like where the different things were mm. in the city and and also comparing like the chapter headings with you like in the original French versus the translations was fun. Um, yeah, there's so some I wanted a bit lost in translation, like some joke. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I think I definitely think there were some things lost in translation, but again, that's that's kind of par for the course with translations, unfortunately. Yeah, I did want to say to you another another theme of this book, a big theme is the bloodthirst of the era. <laughs> um, mm. That's like set out right in the first part. How the people are just they're looking for sport, essentially, they're looking for entertainment and. Um, kind of it's bloody sometimes <laughs> what they're calling for thriving in violence we'll get more into that yes they, it thrives in violence exactly exactly and it just reminded me of this um hardcore history podcast by dan carlin and i don't know how you pronounce it but it's like the word pain and then foot with only one o and then ainment so i don't know here i don't know if i can like i don't i don't think it's right there. Ah! <laughs> so I, it's like, I'll have to like put it in the liner notes or something because uh, it was a great podcast and it explained all that and um, like why that happened, why people were okay with like public hangings and burnings and stuff and why it's like not okay now. It was really, really interesting um, and very much part of our theme here. <laughs> um... Let's see. Okay, and uh, there was one architectural quote that I wanted to give to. Um, it's just such a big part of the story. So he talks about how um, the reasons why he likes medieval art over Renaissance art, and uh, that fashions have more harm that fashions have wrought more harm than revolutions, which is like a big statement considering he's living through revolutions during his time. Um, and he, he believed that architecture was the handwriting of the human race and that you could see in that handwriting the movements in history from, um, he believed that societies went from theocracy to democracy. So he said, you can see the law of liberty following unity written in architecture throughout history. Um, so those are some of the reasons why he wanted to keep architecture. And he was very worried that the printing press would destroy architecture. Mm. And so. everyone who reads It Must Converse is my hundred sub. Thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you, Noah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Noah did, when, when he first came over to my channel, he was all, I, I, he did that for me too. I forget what the number was. It was probably like 200 or something. And then um, he was like, I just went on to my other channel, you know, he has two, and so that he could get me to 200. <laughs> That's, so nice. That's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. Okay. Cool. So let's move on to the spoilery section. Um, Spoiler. Yes, spoilers. Oh so do you happen to know, I haven't really studied feminism in depth, but was there much happening with feminism in 1830 when this was published or 1831 or before then? I wouldn't think because the suffragette movement was later in the 19th later. century. Okay. Um, I think we were too busy beheading all over the novel. <laughs> 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 and when we stopped that and then we were like oh what can we attack now oh yes <laughs> <laughs> okay they were a little focused on other things so because yeah. i was thinking like he's almost like we talked about this a little bit in one of our discussions he's almost like a proto intersectional feminist kind of a guy because he really focuses on 
all the downtrodden people like um bringing sympathy bringing public sympathy to them um over the authorities um mm. really showing you know how this society epically failed this young girl and he writes really strong female characters you know even if they're not quite as i feel like they aren't quite as multifaceted as the men a lot of times are but still they're they're quite strong characters and i was just really impressed by that for a book from 1830. what i liked as well that um is that all the fault of um, everything that happened to those men especially frollo um he could have easily blamed it on esmeralda and he did not went there so i think in that sense he's being feministic for this his era Mm -hmm. The same with um, Phoebus, um, who got um, poignardé, who got, you know, like, how do you <laughs> stab? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, stabbed. Yep. Who That's got the stabbed word. in the chest. He could have blamed it or, you know, easily without, uh, in the narrative, he could have done it in the way that it's all Esmeralda's fault. Uh, for being so cute, for ta taunting those men, for those men, um, and he did not. He mm -hmm. really put the blame on the men. Yes, in the book. like he didn't like shame her or anything for being yeah. sixteen and in love with. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I agree. I appreciated that too. <laughs> <laughs> um. So we talked earlier about how um, the failures of justice at this period were a big theme in the book. And I actually learned from a Botanica article that Hugo actually wrote like a protest novel against the death penalty, which was like so appropriate to this book because uh, the death penalty plays a, a huge role in the plot, obviously, mm -hmm. and uh, a horrible one. And he also like goes on to a tangent, at, not really a tangent, but there were several times where he talked about places where people were hung. Montfaucon, I think is how you pronounce it. I don't know. Yeah. Sure, but, um, it was very gruesome. Just to read yeah. it was very disturbing. And you put a picture yes. of what it looked like. That was... Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty good. In the, right. in the book club, there's, there's a picture of it where there's like windows where people are like hanging in the windows. Multiple people. It's like a structure of where you can hang multiple people it's pretty pretty gross so at that time uh public hangings and executions and the death penalty were um, and... yes yeah yeah we exactly. hadn't invented the guillotine yet but it was coming <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was coming for sure so yeah um he said at, at during his day he feels like it has when he's actually writing this book, he feels like it has, you know, it, it's gone off to the side a little bit. It's not like the focus of society like it used to be. Mm. So, but he said it's, he still wa he wants it stopped. It's a cruel punishment essentially. Um, and he also said uh, about justice at this time, which I thought was a wonderful quote, justice at that epic troubled itself very little about the clearness and definiteness of a criminal suit. Provided that the accused was hung, that was all that was necessary, which we see in the book. <laughs> um, I think we see two uh, ah, posse, uh, judgment being passed. We have two, one mm -hmm. of them with Katsumoto and one with Esmeralda, and the two are just for, like um, simocracy, like they, they, it's, it's just. It looks like someone is being judged, but the judge is half drunk or like uh, half deaf or <laughs> blind and deaf. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and like there, there is actually like no procedure going on. It's just like, do do you all want her to be hanged? Okay, <laughs> let's do it. Like, yeah, they don't need, uh, confession or anything. Simocracy. Yeah. What was it? I'm trying to remember the word, but 
Oh, got you. Yeah, like uh, Michael talked about this in the club. He, it's like you either you admit to being a witch, you know, under torture, or and then we'll kill you, or we'll just keep torturing you until you admit that you're a witch and we can kill you. So there wasn't really a a winning way here. No. <laughs> Um, okay, so, okay, so we talked about this a lot in the club, uh, the fall of Frollo, the archdeacon, and Melanie, you, I, I think it's a big key to the story, and so you mentioned, like, a kind of psychosexual repression theory, and I would love for you to explain that here. Um... What did I say? <laughs> is it about oh, it, it was like, yeah, about Frollo, like, um, like how it was uh, because he was a priest and he was not allowed to express his love. That's yes. kind of what made him go mad. Frollo goes mad, and yeah. So Frollo <laughs> starts out as one of first the first chapters we've got with him. I was like. He seems such like a nice guy. Like, how could this go bad? Like, I remember um, I watched the Disney movie when I was young, ten or something, and I mm. remember just, uh, the image of like Frollo and fire and him being a bad guy, and it was like super scared of him at the time. And when I start reading this, I was like, yeah, Frollo, I remember him, the archdeacons. And, and then he, he seems like such a nice guy, really interested into um, learning and science and um, seeing things through. Like he, um, I think by the time he, he was 18, he was already a priest and very well versed into theology and religion and Christianism and everything. Mm -hmm. And so when he finished that, he, both his parents died. So he took care of his brother. Uh, he had quasimodo under his wing and he started studying science and really got interested in the thing to astronomy and especially alchemy and i was like nothing wrong with that super interesting and it's it, the book says that it, people start talking about him and um wondering why does he study and like what does he want to do does he want the philosophical stone or like uh, there is some rumors going on about him. And mm. I was still like, no, he's a nice guy. Why would people be nasty like that? And then his eyes caught Esmeralda. <laughs> no, no, no. He got really interested too. <laughs> like everything else in his life, it was a passion that caught from him. And because he was not able to act on it, because of him being a priest, mm -hmm. a Catholic, Catholic priest. Um, I wonder if maybe Dickens was a Protestant instead of being Catholic. That would explain. Dickens? Uh, Victor Hugo. <laughs> Victor Hugo? Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I was like looking for his religious history in the Britannica article, but I couldn't see anything specifically that yeah. pertained to religion, so I'm not sure. Because... At, at the time, um, the church was already separating into different, um, the Catholic church was already like separating Anglicanism, Protestant, um, how do, you, do you say that in English, Protestant? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, more in, in England, in the north of Europe, um, but the south, like Italy, Spain, France was still very much Catholic and we had huge religion war at that time uh, in France with our different kings uh, switching between Catholic and Protestant. Mm -hmm. And all this to get to uh, follow cannot act on his feeling of lust for Esmeralda because it's not love, let's be clear. There is no love there. Like at the end, he, he, he tells her, either you're with me or you die. Like who men in love yeah. would do that? Nobody. Yeah, no. <laughs> Everything he wants to get rid of is this passion, this love he has in him. 
no, lust, not love, um, mm. that it cannot act on it. And you see it too in the horrible scene where he tries to rape Esmeralda. Mm -hmm. Very disturbing too. And I think Hugo is trying to educate people about priesthood and about like, yes, those people are um, um, men of God, but that does not make them inhuman. That does not uh, take away their sense of lust and asking them to have this restraint or their life is not um, human. And it will show in different ways um, that will consume them. I, I do not want to be mm. political or uh, enter in any controversy. That's why I'm trying to choose my words very wisely. But you're I doing well. <laughs> is trying to do here uh trying to spark this conversation into friends in the church um yeah <laughs> gonna stop there okay but yeah that seems like a really cohesive take on this Oops. um and i i definitely think that's it's hard to say like exactly what he he was wanting or exactly what he was critiquing um and if that's like the reform he was looking for here um, mm. I didn't, I haven't like, like read all about like what he was doing as far as the church, what he, what he wanted there. But I thought mm. that was a really, that seems like a really, like I said, cohesive take on that. And actually at one point, um, you know, Hugo writes that Frollo recognized the fact that this malevolence in him was nothing but vitiated love. So clearly his inability to express love turned to hate in his heart. And he specifically says that with priests, you know, that love in your heart turns to hate if you can't express it. So um, it definitely seems like that's like a, that, that could be very true. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think um, like, I was trying to understand why this happened now. Is it just that Esmeralda, Esmeralda is like so bewitching that it just, shoved him from his life of priestly study and good works into lust and it just completely changed him or um i think there's possibly an argument to be made that um that his self-discipline had already been kind of going, going down, down. I think because so yeah well the catalyst of that but Right, uh, exactly. Her duty alone was to was the reason of all this, but you could see him going darker and darker, especially in those chapters where he's talking with um, in his chambers with two other men about the different politics of the time and uh, him yeah. going places, um, uh, searching in the ground for that stone and uh, listening to those incredible stories about alchemy and yes i think alchemy was a big mm -hmm. sorry yeah yeah go ahead no no yeah that's it <laughs> yeah I, I think the alchemy like where he where he started wanting knowledge that he could not have um he started like he was if when somebody asked him can't have you figured out how to make gold essentially you know to use the alchemy to make gold he said that if i had done that i would be king <laughs> and um he seems to really want that power and uh that's definitely a change from who he was as a young person so it seems like as he's getting it talks about him getting older there and it seems like i don't know if if his mental state was somehow already kind of going to madness or if it was the search that caused it but um there was some kind of unholy fusion mm. <laughs> that like just it just destroyed his self-control and then when esmeralda came along that's where the tragedy really starts without him i feel like this tragedy wouldn't have happened without frollo pursuing esmeralda yeah for sure for sure and you could see he was already going into a dark path before Esmeralda when you see his interaction with Casimodo. You see how bad he treats mm -hmm. him 
and you see him abuse him and um, verbally and mentally and um, really destructing his self-confidence and self-awareness, a Quasimodo self-confidence. And mm. yeah, you, you right there, you see already that he has deviated from his religion and his beliefs into something darker. Yes, very, very true. Yeah, yes. Okay, so um, let's talk. Oh, um, let's see. Well, in um, so a lot of like internet places seems to say that he was really deserving of pity, and this was another discussion we had in the group. Um, but most of us, after finishing this book, were like not feeling a lot of pity for him. So I think I think the way we can sort of resolve that is he was a better person when we met him and he did good things. But by the end, you know, as and, and I thought it was so appropriate that when he falls to his death, he shouts damnation because <laughs> I think that's a really good indication of where he's going, essentially. <laughs> <sighs> no, he, he knows he's not ascending. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. So he, I, I wouldn't necessarily say he was like a cackling villain, kind of like in the Disney Frollo, but he was mm. pretty close. Like he literally laughs as somebody else is hanging. So it's pretty close to cackling villain status here. But yeah, and I, I would say he in a sense, his actions are even um, even more violent and even more um, worse <laughs> than the action of the Disney movie. In the Disney movie, he's portrayed, he's shown as, but in the book, we are told. Like, we are shown. In the, in the movie, it's not really by his action that we know he's bad. And in the book, it's more about like everything he's doing. And we know we are in his head. We know how we think and how we, he puts in motion this plan, this storyline. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So in the sense, I think, yes, he's I think you're right. Like he's more of a bad character here than in the, the movie, but in the movie, he, he has no balance. Uh, as if in there he has some balance. Yes, yes. Yeah, the book is, it shows, like you said, it shows it, it's deeper, you know, you definitely see him acting out, whereas in the movie, you just, by what he says and, and you know... The flame, and he dressed in yeah. all black, and he's kind of mean, and seeing his uh, expression yes. on his face, you know, that he must not be a nice person, but you are not really, like, yes, you are shown, but not to the extent. That You're not you are. seeing him try and rape Esmeralda and no. <laughs> like, stab thought, like, her lover and all this stuff. <laughs> so we watched a movie, this movie after finishing the book. And mm -hmm. when I finished the book, I was like, who thought oh, that was such a nice story. I must tell that to children. <laughs> I know, right? And then seeing the movie, I still think that. I still think, like, how could they have thought this is appropriate for children? Like, <laughs> there is some theme in there that they do not shy away from some stuff. Of course, some stuff that they are don't even touch on, of course. Thank you. Yes. For a child. But there is still, like, one of the first uh, scene was someone dying, like Quasimodo's mom just mm. selling, dying on, on front of the church for no reason. Um, uh, and Frollo wanted to drown Quasimodo right the, sa the next second. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like, do you want to show that to kids? Like the death of the yeah. Steampunk's dad got me like to, to this day. <laughs> and you want to show this? <laughs> <laughs> and there's and like so you said the lust song yeah oh, and sorry, was, 
they did not shy away from like showing Quasimodo like throwing beans onto the the people who are um, uh, uh, under the church and throwing melted lead on everybody. Like when Polo actually falls from the rooftop of Notre Dame, like the mm -hmm. floor is complete fire. Mm -hmm. fire. <laughs> <laughs> So that must be that all the people that were outside just melted away. Like, this is very, very, very violent. Film yes. For children. Yeah, you're right. It is kind of, I guess maybe add singing and it seems more like it's for children. But yeah, there's yeah. definitely a lot of And, and they're things. gliding on Notre Dame and like, there, it's quite colorful in, in some other ways, but like even when they go in the catacomb and there is like um, bones of people everywhere, skeletons. <laughs> 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 now I understand why my only memory of the movie was like, this is weird, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird like, and scary. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh, man. That was fun, though, to compare them. I, I did enjoy watching that with you in the group. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Uh, they, they, the character where there was no morally gray area, they were either all good or all bad, mm -hmm. all the characters. So Yeah, took, so not a subtle away. book. No, but you can't do that with children like you. Yeah, it's a Something Disney movie. A bit more, yeah, and it's a one hour and a half movie, so you cannot, like... But, yeah, yeah it was very interesting to see uh, the the fusion of Frollo and Jack Langua. Yes. <laughs> the, the, pas Frollo, um, Phoebus. Phoebus and Jack Langua. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know they, they, they should have called him Langua, actually. Because <laughs> there were no Phoebus in there. Yeah, I kept being like, oh, where's Gringoire? He was my favorite character until a certain point in the book. But actually, I think Quasimodo is probably my favorite because he's like a superhero. <laughs> he's awesome. Yeah, <sighs> and they, they tell it very well in the first sentences of the, of the film, the Disney film, where you have that uh, funny French guy who is telling the story, you know, like, I'm going to tell you a story. And he's like, we're going to see who's the man and who's the monster. And talking about Frollo and, and Quasimodo. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, the, it's the summary of those two characters' uh, development. It's like, who is the man or and who is the monster? Is the monster Quasimodo or is is it really the guy that we go to to confess all of our sins. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some symbolism there. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, again with the theme of monstrousness. Who is the real monster here? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Appearances are deceiving all throughout this book. But, uh, yeah. So, so is you there anything else? What is your favorite? Yeah, I, I I love Quasimodo. I think uh, in the beginning, of course, he has his rough edges, but he's still motivated largely by love for the church, the architecture. I thought it was interesting that they made him an artist in the Disney book because I I could sort of see that. Like, he, he mm -hmm. loved the church so much, he, he was, like, part of it. I feel like art probably was somewhere in his soul. <laughs> um and he was motivated by love for the priest and then by love for Esmeralda. And it was a true noble love. And he was so strong. Like that whole scene where he's throwing beams from the roof and all that. Like uh, he, he pretty much is like a superhero. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, he does have weaknesses. And because of his weaknesses, he can't save Esmeralda. So... It's a tragic. It's a tragedy, but his arc, I still feel like, even though it ends in tragedy, I feel like it's a positive growth arc with a lot. He just has a lot of strengths. I think he's the best, my favorite character for sure. <laughs> and yeah, like you said, even though it ends badly for him, he still got a taste of 
pure love of what is loving someone and being not loved but cared for by, by someone. And yes. I really love that. And I one of my favorite chapters in the book was um, book seven, chapter three, The Bells, uh -huh. and yeah. where you get to see Quasimodo in action in the church, ringing the different bells and the story he has with the different bells and like with their sound and everything. It was, I, I, it, it's super short actually. I just realized now it was like two pages, but it it's was very short. It's, it, and I really liked it, really enjoyed that, that part of the book. Michael um, called him Tarzan of Notre Dame. <laughs> Notre Dame. <laughs> He's, yeah. <laughs> hmm. We haven't touched on something yet. We okay, haven't touched on the arc with, with um, what, Fadette? No, what was her name again? Oh, the mom? Are you talking about the mom? Yes. Um, What's her name? Fad Packet. Um, Packet. Packet. Yes. I f yeah, that's true. We didn't really talk about her at all. Um, so Esmeralda, this was one of the... I think part of one of the weaknesses of the book is that we don't get the drives and the motivations of like Esmeralda until like part seven. We learn <laughs> that she's been carrying a little um, amulet. Amulet, yes, thank you, around her neck, and uh, and and she feels like as long as she remains pure, that she will find her mother and be taken care of. And and uh, that's essentially her motivation. And, and when she falls in love with Phoebus, she's very tempted to break it. But we don't understand that whole arc of hers until like part seven. Um, and, but Melanie understood it really early on, as soon as uh, they were talking about the timelines of Paquette, who is a, um, a sister who is like cloistered herself um into a house to pray she mourns the loss of her infant daughter 15 years before and we learned that esmeralda is 16. and right from the beginning melanie was like oh yeah i think esmeralda is her daughter <laughs> and i was like what no way and she is like you don't find out until part 11 but she is <laughs> um i love what hugo did with that storyline where um Paquette was her child was taken away by by what she think are gypsy or she doesn't know what happened to her child. Basically, she went out one day. Her child was like the cutest thing ever, the most beautiful little child, and she was so in love with her. And she was taken away while gypsy were in the town. So she think she was taken away by gypsy, and she vowed to hate gypsy silly and over dates. And every time she hears Esmeralda dancing away with her, how do you call it, the tambourine oh, yeah, uh, yeah, and, yeah. and her goat, she screams and swear to her at her uh, the whole time. And she's like, those gypsies must burn, like kill the gypsies, they're all witches, they put my child away. And she's just, in basically a cell that is a hole in the ground in one of the main square of Paris. And she's been there for 15 he years, praying to God to give her back her child. So she can just have one moment with her child, just smell her for one more time, just have her to herself one more time. And fun fact, the baby, like when she came back to her house, when her baby was taken away, another baby was there instead. And it was Quasimodo. And mm -hmm. she, she took that monstrous baby and took it to the church so it would be cared for and she would not like have to deal with him. And that's how Quasimodo came into the church. And that's how she actually came to Paris because she was not from Paris. And then she put herself in a cell and vowed to never get out until her children was given back to her. And so we learned that Esmeralda is actually looking for her parents, that she's not really a gypsy coming from Spain or she was taken uh, into that group, but it, it's not her family. And by the very, very end, you see Packet and Esmeralda reuniting and it's very heartbreaking. <laughs> it, uh, 
the way it is done, it's um, quite beautiful, well done, but very quickly it goes downhill, like pretty much all the book. <laughs> where uh, Paget tries to hide away Esmeralda from the police, I would say. I don't know the mm. term they were, they were given in English. Um, mm. And she, she's not I able to- I think they use gendarme, maybe. Okay. I think they just so, use that. Yeah. And she was not able to hide her away. And so um, Esmeralda was hung up and her mom died from sorrow in an instant because her child was taken away from her the, for a second time. Yeah. But the brief reunion they had was very beautiful and it was another type of love that this book touched on. Motherly mm -hmm. love, mother-daughter type of love, which was very beautiful as well. And I love that yeah. the instant <laughs> she has her child and love with her as like the second before mm -hmm. she was still swearing at her the, the switch was super quick and <laughs> yeah she, she was also praising gypsies all of a sudden <laughs> so i think maybe Hugo wanted to show like our perception of different group or different people it's just what it is, our perception. Like it can switch in an instant. It's not based mm -hmm. into fact. It's just uh, the, the perception of um, the differences, our, our own differences. That's a really good point. He's tackling prejudice here and he does it earlier too when Gringoire is watching the trial of just a witch. He doesn't know who it is. But he's kind of getting into it like, oh, yeah, you know, the the fact that you remember the the coin turned into a leaf in the drawer. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that definitely sounds like a witch. And then Esmeralda is introduced and immediately he's like horrified. And, and like and, and I feel like that almost is like the last time he really cares for Esmeralda, because after that, all he cares about is Jolly. But um, the point was his prejudice was instantly like changed as soon as he had a face of a person that he knew in place of that gypsy witch you know which was in his mind it really changed um, yeah and that wasn't like the first time either <laughs> that was touched on as well in the film where Casimodo was praised for being the the king of the who of the I, I yeah, can't the remember kings of the fools. The yeah. They they used the king um, of fools. <laughs> the king of fools, yeah. and the instant someone uh, starting swearing at him, everybody else did it, like in an instant. Like people starting throwing things at him and swearing at him, and uh, so we see that as well in the movie as well as in the book. Where and it happens several times. Um, we see the prejudice against. Um, Kazimodo just because of his appearance. Um, even we haven't touched on Jehan. Oh, we Hodo, did it. <laughs> There's so much. That is the comic relief of this book, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, even him, like he doesn't want to have anything to do with Kazimodo because he's a monster or think he's a monster. Even though his brother have had him for like 15 years and like taught him how to read and everything he does not have any relationship with him mm. am i blurry you look pretty good when you move real fast sometimes it gets yeah. blurry <laughs> i'm gonna get like a plug so that i can plug my internet directly into my computer because right now we have one like cord but it's plugged into my husband's computer because he's the one earning the money <laughs> so <laughs> we had to buy another one for me and it's on the way so hopefully <laughs> next time we do this there will be no blur at all <laughs> <sighs> but anyways um yeah there are so many good characters in here it's hard to even talk about them all and all their all their yeah. arcs but I'm glad you brought them up because I didn't even write them in my notes. 
we haven't talked about ratings. Ratings. Oh my gosh. I honestly don't rate books very much because I I feel like, like I, I can never make up my mind. <laughs> but what are you what are your thoughts on it? Well, I feel like uh, we should have two types of ratings. Um, like our own enjoyment, our own like was this my taste or not? Did I have fun reading this? Was it interesting to me or mm -hmm. what I'm interested in? And did the author did a good job to portray what he set to portray or to tell the story was uh, set to tell? And so for my own enjoyment, um, it's not like I'm not going to reread this unless of time, unless of time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because it was quite difficult. The um, vocabulary, like the writing style was very beautiful, but quite hard like it's not something you just pour into and you just get absorbed in 600 pages like in a day um right i'm glad i've read it uh i don't think i would reread it that soon uh so for my own enjoyment it's close to 3.5 i would say mm -hmm. but okay. for what it did i really like the historical part of it um the different characters i i was very surprised that i got attached to them so much i didn't thought i would care that much about those characters so and that like for what the book really is and what it did i would give this a 4.5 i think okay that sounds reasonable i would mm -hmm. put that i would i could yeah, I would. You could get on board with that. that. I could get on board with that. <laughs> Honestly, I like I said, I as far as my feelings go, th there was so much feeling to this book. There were so many moments that I just wanted to highlight and like make into a little image thing and put it in the group. And mm. that's what I love in books is when it's the writing and the thought connect in such a way that it's just gorgeous that you want to share it with everybody. And that happened so many times when I was reading this. And I we got really emotional about the character arcs, and the setting was just amazing. Mm. <laughs> I learned so much, and and reading this in conjunction with his introduction to romanticism, I just feel like it was like an intellectual and an emotional thing. So <sighs> I don't know. Like I said, I hate reading, but I'll I'll go with yours because, like you said, it wasn't the easiest read. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think what you said is good. <laughs> I loved as well, like some part of the writing style of Hugo is so beautiful. And especially when we were watching Paris or when we were watching Notre Dame, it felt like we were flying and like seeing all of this. It, yeah. Uh, like it wasn't but, like, I struggled a little bit, but it wasn't too much. And it, it was very beautiful in the sense where we had that overview and we, it felt like um, very cinematic, you know, like we were zooming in on something and then back and then on something else. And he was very well por portrayed and sold. Yeah, I think. Yes, yeah, exactly. Cinematic is a good term for it. It's cinematic mm. before the movies. <laughs> yeah, before the inventions of the movies. <laughs> uh, well, I think that a about wraps up our discussion. What do you think? I think so too. <laughs> think so? Okay. <laughs> um, this was really, really fun. I really enjoyed reading this with you, Melanie. And we're going to have to do this again sometime because like I yeah. said, you're just so insightful and hopefully we can read another French classic together because I know oh, you're okay. doing that on your channel. <laughs> the Count of Monte Cristo. Do you want twice this? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, we'll do months. that after the storm and I read along. <laughs> that would be great, actually. I would totally be down with that. <laughs> I really want um, to read it, but I need the push. I need someone else to read it with me because it's way too big. <laughs> I know. Ah. Um, okay. So that was wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on with me. And thank oh, you, perfect. Noah and Danny, for coming along and watching with us. And uh, and for everybody else who watches this later, wow, this is a long video. Thank you for watching it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And 
you to Christy for hosting all of this and making this possible and like learning how to <laughs> go with technology <laughs> and everything and um, making summaries and having all those notes and insightful quotes to talk about. Uh, you did a great, great job. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> All right, you guys have a very happy Sunday. I think it's, isn't it like Ascension Sunday or, or something like that? I yes. don't remember what it's called. Tomorrow so, is the big holiday in France. Aha. Uh -huh. They're working. Okay. It's big holiday. <laughs> All right. You have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And, and I didn't see you enjoying your wine, well, Melanie, but I hope you enjoy your wine. <laughs> there we go. Oh, she finished it. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. Take care and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>